Hello everyone, I was just wanting to uh, share a few thoughts I had with you this morning. Um, I was thinking about uh, Elijah, and so some of my examples this morning will we'll talk about Elijah. Uh, when I was a younger man, uh, I used to travel out of town on my job, and uh, they had a Gideon Bible. Back then we didn't have cell phones and uh, computers, you know, personal computers and that sort of thing. So you either had to take your Bible, which I did, and concordance and all that. But it's a pretty good bit of trouble packing your bags for a night or two out of town and then packing all that too. So uh, I would rely on the Gideon Bible a lot. So I read a lot about Elijah. So today I'd like to read you a couple of stories about him, maybe in something else. And then, uh, but the first story I want to read about you, read to you is, um, is going to be uh, Elijah. He passed by this same path uh, in his journeys. And uh, so he passed by this widow, this uh, woman's house. And uh, she perceived that he was a man of God that passes her continually. And, um, and it came and it fell on a day that Elijah passed to shoot him where there was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said to, unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. And uh, she said, Let us make a little chamber, I pray, on the wall, and let us set for him a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall come to pass that he shall turn in thither. So my thoughts on this is, uh, this is my Little, this is my office. Uh, I've been in this office for 30 years. We've lived here 30 years, and it didn't call for an office and the plans, but Melinda uh, got them to do the plans in such a way that I could, could be in here. And I spend a lot of time in here. It's sort of like a laboratory or, uh, you know, entering your closet. I can get in here and, uh, and have a, a clear mind and, and few distractions. So... Uh, but Proverbs, if I can find it real quick, says, hold on with me. It said, the man's gift maketh room for him and bring him before great men. Uh, so I, I'm not in the same room. I'm in this room quite a bit more than any other room of my life. But I've got this room uh, in my mind and in my heart, and I try to make room for him. I can carry him here and here. But if I don't make room for him, uh, if I let it get too crowded in either one of these two places, he won't come and join me. That might be a silly little thought to you, but but I make room for God and uh, in hopes that he can come and uh, be with me as much as he can. And let's see where else I want to go. Oh, uh, let's see. Right here, I think it is. Uh, this this woman that it says that, that I'm in Second Kings four. I'm gonna start at chapter one. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditors is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what thou hast in the house. And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, Go borrow the, the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou come in, thou shalt shut the door unto thee and thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all the vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. 
So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought her the vessels to her, brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. God has got a abundance of things, and he'll pour out if we can if we can get our prayer through to him. And she poured out, and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me not a bring me yet a, a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay the debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. And um, I thought about that her pouring out. She had a full vessel. She had an empty vessel. She pours into this empty vessel. Now this vessel's full and this vessel's full. And uh, I thought about it like love. Uh, if, if I've got $100 and I give you 50, then I don't have 50 anymore. Uh, it's multiplication. You know, some things you add, and this is multiplication. If, if I give you 50, I just got 50, and you've got 50. But if I got love, I can give you all I've got, and I'll have no less, and you can have all you receive. Uh, the pouring out, the, the, the oil went into the empty vessels. Uh, I don't act full all the time, because if I'm full, then God won't pour into me. If you're full, then... Uh, God won't supply you with the word of God like he would if you were empty, hungry, and begging. Uh, so that's my thoughts on this today, some of them. And um, so you need to act like that you not full. I remember a time at, at Meridianville. It was more at the first. We've been there 20 years. Uh right at 20 years, and, and it was more like at the first, uh, or a little ways, just a little ways down the road, and uh, I got so dry. I don't know if you other brothers that's in the ministry have ever got that way, but I could not come. It was so dry. And you know, he said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by, by, thereby. Uh, the word, in my opinion, is drawn out. Uh, people get hungry. You, you take a, a child on a bottle. Uh, we've got some great grandbabies and they're on the bottle and they draw that milk out of the bottle. God's not gonna let you go hungry, but if you act like you're full and don't need anything, uh, you're not gonna get anything. You have to, so uh, I, I would go to church and I'd see the faces of the people of Meridable and they looked like they were hungry and I had nothing. I, I didn't have anything to give them. And time after time, that happened for a pretty good while, and I just got to mourning before God and begging him to let me have something. And somebody prayed. I don't know who it was. It really don't matter. And I had a vision, and I went to this refrigerator looking for milk. And when I opened the door, milk just started falling out of the refrigerator. And that's the way it happened to me. During that period of time, I went from dry to, um, to having an abundance. And uh, so I thank the Lord for that. I just wanted to tell you about the room. God wants to have a room here. You have to clean out a room. Um, I've got some items in here, probably needs cleaning out right now, but you, you have to clean out the closet or the trunk or something sometimes to, to make room for something better. So... Uh, and, and it came to me to tell you this story that I've probably told you if you've been around me much, many times, but maybe to help somebody. Uh, I've, I've seen little children that couldn't talk. Different ones of those uh, start talking. But what I wanted to tell you about was about myself. Well, Brother Dale, you told me about that before, but I want to tell you again. Uh, in 2001, my vision started going, not 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 straight on vision, but my peripheral vision. Uh, me and Melinda would get in the car. I would be driving. I'd look down the road to see if anything was coming, and I could see cars, uh, say if there's just one car. If two, I knew which lanes we were in, but if it was just one car, I couldn't tell which lane he was in. And I'd ask Melinda, are they in that, you know, where I could go on out in the other lane? 
And she'd say no or yes or whatever. And uh, that was great, but I did a lot of driving by myself and I knew that I needed to know which lane there was in for myself. So I went to the people that gave me the glasses. I think you call them an optometrist. And uh, they said that they could see that my eyes were having problems, that my peripheral vision was going and they couldn't tell. They sent me to an ophthalmologist and he said that it was beyond his expertise. So then I was sent to an ophthalmologist neurologist in Birmingham. And uh, he asked me some questions. I've, I've shuffled my feet uh, all my life. And some other questions he asked me, they, they were yes. And he said, uh, I think it's water on the brain. He said, do you have any, and I knew I had that, but he said, do you have any CAT scans or MRIs? I had 62 treatments for cancer on this side of my head and 20 over here, so 82 treatments. And I said, yeah, I've got CAT scans in my M and MRIs, and he said, take them to Dr. Newton in Birmingham. So me and Melinda drove down to Birmingham, and we go see this man I've never met. I take an MRI, CAT scans, or whatever I've got. I think they had two, one of each. And I go down there, and so I see the receptionist. I leave her the, the scans. She says, have a seat, and he'll call you in a minute. So just in a little bit, they call me, tell me to go in. And so I've never met this doctor, and he's never met me. I don't know what to expect. He don't know what to expect. So I come in. Uh, he comes in there, and I'm sitting down, and he said, Mr. Cantrell. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, Mr. Cantrell. Well, I knew right away he was confused. I could tell. A man that's got that much education, a, a neurologist, uh, I was ready to go home because I knew he shouldn't, have, he shouldn't be confused. And he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good. How are you doing? He said, he was doing good. So... Uh, he said, tell me about you. Uh, he said, when you started the school, said, was you small for your age? And I said, yes, sir. I started when I was five and the rest of them started when, you know, whatever age. I was young. I was, so I was small. He said, was, were you slow? Well, I'm telling you, I didn't know he was talking about slow. I thought he was talking about slow. And I said, no, I could outrun just about everybody in school. And he laughed and he said, well, tell me about yourself. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, what do you want to know? And he said, well, tell me about your birth. I said, I don't know anything about it. My mother was sick. She lost about uh, flu or whatever, and she lost about 10 pounds. And I weighed four pounds and nine ounces. And he said, uh, well, just tell me about the rest of your life. So I'm ready to go. And, um, and But I don't want to make this fast, so I just told him. I said, well, I went to high school. I graduated from Lee High School in Huntsville. Uh, I got married, I had two children, I got drafted in the army, and uh, so when I came out of the army, I had the GI Bill, so uh, I wasn't going to church, Melinda was, but I wasn't, uh, so that wasn't a priority with me. If I had my time to do over with, I'd probably just took a trade or something, but I went to UAH, and I, I'm telling this man all of this, and I said, I was on the Dean's list. Uh, I was on, a member of Omicron Delta Epsilon, Economic Honor Society. And I was president of Society for Advancement of Management. Now, I'm not trying to impress you that much, but uh, I wanted to get him off my back. And I told him all these things. And he said, well, that, that's enough, after I told him so much. And he said, uh, when I came out here, I wasn't looking for you. And I said, well, I knew that. And... Uh, he said, I was looking for a, a retarded man, a slightly retarded man that somebody was taking care of. And I said, well, Doc, I'm not going to argue that part with you, the retarded part, but there's nobody taking care of me. So I felt like the most fortunate man in the whole wide world. And I just about am. I am. So anyway, I came home. I told my mother this story that I'm telling you right now. And my mother said, well, I knew it but I never did tell you. And uh, she said, I knew you had some problems, but I wanted to give you a chance in life, so I didn't tell you what your uh, drawbacks were. And uh, she said, when you were about sitting alone age, I'd set you up, sit, sit you up, and you your head was so big, you'd just fall over to one side. I would pick you back up, set you back straight, and you'd fall off to the other side. And she said, I got worried. Mother 
and daddy didn't go to church. But she said, I got worried and I took you to the doctor, which was probably about 1949. They knew so little. And uh, she said, he told her, said, ma'am, if you had all the money in the world, you couldn't help this child. But God helped me. And uh, so if you've got a child that's having dif difficulties, uh, at our church, we say, did you come looking for a miracle? I definitely believe in miracles. And uh, I appreciate you this morning. appreciate you listening to this. I hope this testimony helped you. Um, but if not, in this sermon, but if not, uh, just put it in your pocket. It might come up and help you sometime in the future. So i uh, done been a little long this morning, but I want to tell you I love you and thank you very much and hope to see you soon. And uh, if you need me, let me know.